Action. I decided to stop my activity. I, I'm not an artist anymore, and this is forever. Okay. If I start again one day, please don't be interested by what I'm doing. I cannot. I cannot make something interesting because my nature is such that I can do something. I have a, I have a culture. I have an environment. I live in a particular time, and I can do certain things. Uh, but I'm, I'm not going to do suddenly something else uh, which can be interesting. So I say, look. I stop forever. If I start again, forget about it. Okay, don't be interested. And uh, it lasted six years, but because they had, at that time I had so much energy, uh, you know, after a while I started to feel that, oh my God, you know, I've got to do something again. I have to, I have some ideas. Perhaps I should develop those ideas. And then, no, 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 no. It's not going to be interesting. I cannot do things which are as radical as what I did before. So I refused to start. And one day I started to do something. On a very simple way, and I was making those paintings, but I was hiding them. Nobody could see them for at least three, four months. Uh, but you see, there is still this relationship with mathematics, since you have an angle here, 90 degrees, 90 degrees. You see, the work now is very simple, it's not sophisticated. You, you can understand that very easily. But uh, what is interesting here is that the work is auto self referential. The work talks about itself. It defines, you know, this canvas, it's two angles of 90 degrees, and this is what it is. There is no possible interpretation. So there is this sort of objectivity that I had before in my work. You know about Frank Stella who said, what you see is what you see. You know about uh, Donald Chud who talks about specific objects. Well, this is in the vein of uh, this sort of thinking. Kind of thinking. So this is one. Now I just want you to realize that the subject here is an angle, but the, line, the angle is made of two lines which join here. Okay, so the line is starting to get involved in the work when I'm not thinking about it at that time. So you see the line is here again, but we have arcs, and the arc is 26 degrees. This is a way to to limit the interpretation from people. If it was not written, this would be just a geometrical shape. Where here I say no. It's an arc of 286 degrees. It's very specific. So I do that. This is now you have two arcs here with a amount of degrees each time. You see that the line is really the subject of my work. And here angles. So I do all kind of variations like this on the, with angles, arcs, and also here with straight lines, you see. So again, the subject is the line. It's funny because we are very disturbed by this, these two lines here. <coughs> Okay, straight lines again. I'm trying to create as many formal, you know, new composition as much as I can. Trying to do something that doesn't look like what we see every day. But of course, it's true that we are. I belong to that uh, that uh, minimalist kind of uh, sensibility, you know. Okay, and one day, so you see, here you have a straight line, but you still have a canvas to to hold the line, okay? And one day I'm thinking, well, what about getting rid of a canvas and putting the lines directly on the wall? And uh, which is what I did. You see, I take one line, cut in plywood, and I put it here, directly on the wall, and again, I put the definition about it, in, uh, of it. And uh, I do that with angles, and I do that with, uh, again, with angles. There is one at the gallery, uh, Art Pureau, uh, today, that you will see at the exhibition. And then uh, I do it with arcs again. And what is happening is that I'm doing angles, straight lines, and chords, and so on, you know, and, and then I'm thinking, my God, but I'm stuck. Where am I going to go from there? And, you know, it's my nature. I'm never satisfied. I want to go beyond. So one day I'm thinking, look, when you have done a straight line, when you have done a broken line or a curve, what else can you do? You know, in geometry, you cannot do anything else. And I'm thinking that I have to stay in this mathematical thing because it's my context. I cannot go away from it. Until the day that I said, well, why, why can't I go away? Why do I have to stay in geometry? So I'm thinking, the only variation which is possible now is a line which goes like crazy, you know, a free line, not determined mathematically like the others. So I do what I call the indeterminate line. And um, the first time I made one, I showed it to my dealer in France, and I said, look what I could do. And he comes and he said, Bernard, forget about it, destroy it. Because if people see that you are going into some crazy things like this, they are not going to believe in you anymore, and uh, nobody is going to be interested. You know, so I made one, and I made two, and I made three, you know. And, uh, and then I got convinced that it was a possibility. 
opportunity and why not? And after all, I prefer to make a mistake for a year or two, but uh, one day, uh, eventually, something is going to come out. Oh, then I will go back to something, you know, because I, I, I went in the wrong way. So I do that, and one day, I, since I want to, to go beyond, you know, I, now I start to make the line that goes on top of itself, you see? And I do that, like a spiral kind of shape. And this is the last one I made before I started to do, well, okay, the, the real indeterminate line, as you know it, uh, in sculpture. But uh, just before, uh, I go into sculptures by making again the arcs like this, leaning against uh, the wall, the angles. You see, these are arcs again, and I make a few variations, and one day I'm thinking, okay, look, why not, since I was starting to get out of a wall with those reliefs, I could make a sculpture that really gets out of the wall. And uh, these are the very first indeterminate line in steel that I made. But uh, I didn't know how to, it was so difficult to control the making of those pieces, but I could not even make them stand in the middle of the room because you don't do what you want. You know, the technique that we used was never uh, explored before. And, um, and I was just happy to do something that I could put against the wall. You see, this is my first exhibition. None of the line was able to stand by itself, so I put them against the wall and uh, I exhibited them like this. Well, they are wall reliefs after all, you know. And, but very quickly, I found a solution. I just understood that if you make an oval, the piece is going to hold like this, you see. But if you make an oval and you want it to stand up like this, it's going to fall, of course. So, you know, the brain has to adapt sometimes. I'm a little slow. And uh, then I made some monumental pieces, like this one in, um, in Paris, at uh, La Défense. This, uh, this is, these are typical of the indeterminate lines. There is one in uh, Singapore, actually, you know them. Uh, this is one in uh, Taiwan. But anyway, these are variations that was exhibited at, uh, at Versailles last year. Okay, that's it. So it become more and more complex now. You see, at the beginning, I'm happy to turn, to bend a piece of steel and to pre present it like this. But uh, now that I master very well that technique, I can do pretty much what I want. And uh, when it's very complex like this, in order for the lines to go into each other, I make maquettes and then I try to make them big. I never succeed in making exactly the same thing because it's, you know, making those things, you have no idea, you know, it's in steel. 11 centimeters by 11 centimeters, so a piece like this weighs about 15 tons, and when you are trying to bend this thing, you know, it's extremely dangerous, first of all, and you don't hit it, you bend the steel cold like that. So it's, it's a real fight that you have with the steel, and you try to do something, and the steel does something else, so then you adapt, you say, ha ha ha, you know, I'm going to get you here, and then you just fight constantly until you get something that looks like uh, something, you know, convenable as we see in French. Okay, now I'm uh, developing the arcs. After making too many of the indeterminate lines, too, not too many, but I'm making, after making many, there is a funny story. One day I was in a bar with the artist Denis Oppenheim. We're having a beer, a beer, the two of us, and, um, and uh, we are at the bar like this, and uh, there is a window just like that, and there is the street, you know. And suddenly I see a guy passing by, uh, Teshuva, that's his name, he wrote a book on Andy Warhol, he's passing by mm. and I see him and he goes, he sees me, so I say, hey, hi, you know, of course he cannot hear me and I cannot hear him, he's outside in the street, he goes like this, but he's with someone and um, he says to this someone, oh, this is Bernard Bonnet, of course I cannot hear it, but I see that he shows me like this, and the guy goes, uh, Bernard Bonnet, Bernard Bonnet, and he says, and I see my friend doing that, and the guy goes, oh, of course, you know, so, so I said, oh, 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 oh. You know, I have so much to develop, so much to do, but I'm going to uh, develop other uh, possibilities in sculptures. And so I went, up, I went back, I mean, I developed a lot the arcs. These, uh, they were simple. Now this is arcs in disorder uh, that was exhibited in Versailles. Uh, another one, now I'm doing leaning arcs, you see, they go into each other like this, just different kind of composition. These are variations on the leaning arcs. Okay, that's uh, inside uh, my studio in the south of France, where I have a huge factory in which I can make big installations like that. And it's very important to, it's not like an exhibition space, it's just that when you're a painter, you can make a painting, you sit in front of it, you look at it for a while, you analyze, you try to improve it. Here are those big things, you have to live with them for a while, turn around, 
think about it and change the, comp the composition or, uh, you know, in order to find the, the ideal solution. So I have to live with them. These are what I call the effondrement. Uh, I was talking about it this morning. You know, it's the contrary of constructivism. Uh, an artist uh, who is doing construction, uh, constructivism in a way, is going to put like this, like this, and he's going to, to stick that on it, and uh, like round stuff, he's going to make a construction, okay? Here it's totally the opposite. This, originally, you have some arcs which are very well put together, you know, in a nice, clean uh, arrangement, and suddenly, bam, you know, like you come with a, a forklift, or there is an earthquake, or whatever, and everything goes, collapses, you know? And, and this is what I'm showing, the destruction of what was previously on a stable state, let's say. This is uh, what I call the vertical arcs, so that's the type of work that was exhibited in Versailles, I think we'll see a picture after. I have a huge one like this, if one day you go to, uh, to New Zealand, near Auckland, I have a, a huge piece like this, which is uh, 27 meters tall, which is relatively successful, perhaps we will have the image actually. Yeah. That's in Nice, if one day you go to the Riviera, uh, it's a sculpture in Nice, right in the center on uh, Place Masséna. That's in Berlin, one day that I was installing that piece. One of my very first commission, because very early on, I wanted to make big pieces. Not that it's more interesting when it's big, I'm more satisfied when I create something small, which is radically new in the context of art history, rather than making something that already existed and making it big. But making it big, you know, it's like, uh, you know, you can show that you can also make something like this, that it works very well, that it stands at the level of the city. Uh, it's, an, it's a different experience. So very early on, I, I cheated uh, by pretending that I knew how to make huge pieces. I made photo montages of, first I photographed sculptures big like this, and uh, I photograph them in such a way that if I put them in a landscape, if I am very low, they look very big. So I presented that to everybody. People trusted me, thinking that I was able to make huge sculptures. And this, of course, you've got to make one for our city. And uh, then I found a way, and you know, that's how I, I managed to, uh, to do huge things. See, this is in Berlin. That's in Gen Geneva, Switzerland. That's the same one in front of the university. That's in Austin, Texas. That's a, one of the very first uh, 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 command public, how do you say that? You know, commission that I got. It's 30 meters tall, just for you to laugh and make fun of myself. Every year for Christmas, we put lamps here, you know? Like, uh, it looks like a Christmas tree. I'm so mad, someone told me that. And, uh, I just don't have a good lawyer to sue them, but uh, I should do it. Okay, that's it again. Uh, this is a nice experience I did. I have a, uh, in the south of France, we, we have like three buildings. One is for the collection that I do with my wife. One is for my work and, uh, you know, uh, only the sculptures, like the one you saw, the big one before. And then I have a new space, which is a new gallery space, in, where in the future, when all that will have become a foundation, we will exhibit other artists. And at this stage, I'm still using it to do, you know, to, to experiment things. And one day, I had 100 tons of steel being put like this, you know, in disorder, just to work on this idea of collapses, you know. And I just had that put like this, and it, it was a very spectacular uh, piece. And uh, here on the wall, it's written um, uh, straight bars, uh, disorder, uh, 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 steel X C. 10, which is the nature of the steel, 140 bars and 100 tons, that's the weight of a piece. So here again, you see like uh, on all the pieces before, we have to go back. Here, for example, there is written angle of so many degrees, I don't know now. But each time for all the pieces that I made, there is always a definition. This is in order to fight against the interpretation. This is very much in the family of the specific objects that uh, Donald Trump was talking about. So I wanted to put the definition, so there is no interpretation. People cannot say, oh, what does this, what does that look like? Or what is it, you know, what, what you see is what it is. And I did that, of course, I did the sculptures with angles. Much less, I don't have many possibilities with angles, uh, putting groups like this. But I'm very happy with this type of work, it's very successful. This is another one, totally free. First one was on the wall, this one is totally free in space. 
That's a typical collapse of uh, effondrement, collapse of arcs. Uh, this is one that I showed in Versailles and the big perspective of, uh, of, uh, of Versailles. Uh, this is an exhibition that I did uh, uh, the, you know, in, uh, in Venice uh, three years ago. Uh, that space was given to me. I had 2,000 square meters and, uh, and uh, uh, I just made several variations you know, on the theme of art like this. Uh, that's a collector in, in, in Belgium who wanted to have a sculpture of mine, but when I arrived on his property, I saw that there, he had these little small cliffs like this. And I thought, oh, forget, I'm not going to sell you a regular sculpture that you are going to pick up somewhere. I, I just want to use, finally, you know, this idea that they have of putting an art leaning against, uh, against that small cliff like this. And uh, this is 25 meters long. Okay, now sculpture with straight line, but in space, and this is one which is at uh, Art O'Meyer Sculpture Park in America. Uh, that's another one, but again, you see, sometimes people come and say, oh, you know, we collect sculptures, we would like to have one of yours, and I said, no, 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 I want to do something with your building. So this is like, a, a, I mean, it's a not very old chateau, probably 18th, 19th century, and I just say, oh, we have to put a bar of steel just leaning against it. And for me, it's exciting, it's more interesting than to just selling a uh, sculpture. This extends and shows the dimension of uh, the, the scope, uh, you know, that I can uh, develop in my work. Okay, this is in Nice. If one day you go to Nice, you will see the arc from before, but you will see this one, which is now in the middle of a promenade des Anglais. This is 30 meters tall, uh, pretty big. Now, if there is a red flag here, the, the, the French flag, I mean, it's because the president of France uh, inaugurated it that day. And, uh, took some pictures at that time. This is in Florida. That's a sculpture in uh, indeterminate line in Strasbourg, one of the very first also uh, commission that they got. This is in Denver, Colorado. It's big, it's like 10 meters tall, so it means that it's about 18 meters like this. Denver is a fantastic city. I don't know if anyone here is involved with, uh, with uh, uh, commissions in the city of Singapore, but Denver is really an example in the world of, uh, for a city who is, uh, each time that a new building is being built, they have uh, the one percent to do art. And uh, they ended up after, after 20 years to have now one of the most incredible collection of, uh, of art in the city. Uh, they have uh, all the best artists, uh, you know, uh, just, uh, it's, a, it's, it's like a museum outside. Because they really respected this idea of the one percent. Yeah, that's in, uh, in Germany. This is a very complicated sculpture to make when you know that this, from here to here, is 8 meters already. So this is 28 meters altogether. And uh, it's complex because the sculpture is partly inside, outside, and then on top of the roof and going like this. It was, of course, all I mean, thought, calculated, engineered with uh, the engineers, with the architects of, uh, of the building. Very complicated to do, but uh, we succeeded. That's another view of the sculpture. It's 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 uh, the tallest. No, the tallest one is in in uh, in, uh, in Seoul. Uh, yeah, this is a plan because again, you see, when I make those huge sculptures, of course, I cannot just say, oh, we're going to do that, you know, and I make a little maquette like this. No, we need to have engineers. We need to have a, a very sophisticated architect who think about how is it going to be built. You know, the foundation, the, the concrete foundation, you know, how deep they are, what is the thickness of the steel uh, on the lower part, on the upper part, and so on. It's, it's very complex for pieces like this one that you see now, which was 25 meters, uh, and especially that underneath there is the subway, so if a sculpture passes through the city, you can guess the damage that it could do, it could make. That's the piece again. And that's one in uh, Auckland, New Zealand. That's in Seoul. That's the biggest one I've made uh, so far. Uh, no, because uh, this is 30 meters. So this is 28 meters. That's in Seoul, uh, Korea. You see the guy here. It's not very big compared to the sculpture. It's a recent commission. It's about one 
year and a half or, or two years. Uh, this is a sculpture that I made in, uh, yeah, there is a distortion, everything is uh, it's funny because it looks, uh, it looks very thick compared to the reality. But um, that was my exhibition in Versailles. I could exhibit about eight sculptures, and this one was the, at the entrance of Versailles where there is a statue of Louis XIV right at the entrance. You know, you have a city there, and then, then there is a big area, and then the chateau. So I thought that it would be interesting to have those two arcs like this, those two groups of arcs as a, as a sort of gate, you know, to the glory, of course, of Louis XIV and to also to frame the Versailles. And, uh, and uh, I must say that it has been, um, it has been, it was very successful. It worked very well. Uh, you can see it from the side here. Uh, you see how the people are, they are pretty small and still they are very close to us here. Yeah, that's a sculpture in New Zealand. I didn't know that we had, this, uh, we had it here, but you can see uh, the great thing about this uh, uh, piece is the location. Uh, you know, they have, they have uh, solid sculpture, very big, I mean, huge sculptures. We have, we have Anish Kapoor, 80 meters long. We have Roy Richard Serra, 150 meters long. And uh, suddenly they put me on top of a hill like this, and uh, all those guys who are great artists, they look like uh, little things, you know. So I'm standing up there, and I, I look at them, and I'm standing like that. It's a little embarrassing. Actually, to tell you the truth, I'm a little scared, but Richard Serra goes there because he might punch my nose uh, when he sees it. He's going to be so upset, you know, because I really put him in a bad, bad situation. Uh, but they really get me the best best angle, I mean the best location, since I am on the top of the hill. You can see that sculpture from five or six kilometers away, from outside of the sculpture park, actually. Ah, okay, now we go into something else. If I have a glass of water, it would be great. No, I'm, it's okay, it's okay to get on the um, So you see, I'm, I'm doing those things, and uh, but, but again, you know, I'm, sometimes I'm in a mood where I'm, Damn it, it's always the same thing, you know, which actually is not always the same thing, but, but I need to change everything. And one day I'm in my apartment in, uh, in, uh, in New York, uh, in my loft, and, uh, and, and this environment in my living room is, thank you, very uh, sweet, is uh, the same, I mean, you know, regular art, you know, with a frame, and uh, I mean, there is a solo wheat, which is a wall drawing extremely historical, I mean, something that anybody will fight, you know, to get, but still, I have seen it for at least four years, and I want to change all that, so I decided, okay, I'm going to take out everything here, and I'm going to put the mathematical equation, just like in the early days, and the mathematical equation was actually a poetry thing, it was not a work of art at that time, it's something that you cannot read, of course, I don't know who here can read this, good answer, uh, uh, but I thought that it's so abstract, you know, that it's interesting. I paint my wall in yellow, and I just put that mathematical equation on the wall. And suddenly I'm thinking, my God, this is very exciting. It's so much better than art that looks like art. And uh, I decided to go on and develop this thing, especially that, that particular year I had many museum exhibitions coming up, especially in Switzerland and in uh, South America. So, uh, and in Germany also, this was done in Germany. But, um, so I started to paint directly on the wall some mathematical, some scientific diagram, actually. And how did I choose that? As much as in the, in the 60s, the work was very involved with theory, and I was not choosing the work. It had to be chosen by someone else. It had to be very important. The criteria for the choice was the importance of the subject. Here, no. Here, I'm thinking, if that doesn't look like art, I'm going to do it. And, and I always select diagrams which are so far away from what we know in painting, usually. So this is one possibility. You see, this is another one here with arrows. Perhaps we'll see better. This is, of course, very, very abstract. Okay? Uh, and uh, i show you one or two more before I tell you, I give you more information. This is, this is the type of thing. Here I was interested because this has to do with chaos. And, and yes, my sculptures were involved with chaos also. I show you a few, but let's take this as, as an example. The theoretical aspect of that. Originally, I'm thinking, you know, it's interesting because it has never been explored. It's interesting because it doesn't look like math, like uh, like figuration and like abstraction. But then there is another consequence, very simple to understand. You all know what is abstract art. You know from Kandinsky, Malevich, Mondrian, all the way to today. You know exactly what has been created in abstraction. 
Okay. This doesn't look like an abstract painting. You've never seen that in a book of abstract art. And still, you have to recognize that what you have here on a canvas as a painting is the highest level of abstraction that a work of art can present. So it's interesting that if you talk about abstraction, we never thought of that. And this is more abstract than abstract paintings. So I just think that because of that, it's an interesting aspect that could be developed, of course. But here I say that in one sentence. These are other variations of uh, an exhibition in, uh, in Seoul. That's my studio in New York. Okay, and more recently, after doing those early pieces where you have just a simple, simple things taken from books without any change, no composition, nothing special, I decided to try to make some paintings that I call saturation, where I put equation on top of each other, just to make it even more confusing, more abstract, more unreadable in a way. I'm interested in general by things that I don't understand. What I understand, I'm bored with it immediately. What I don't understand, well, there is something to learn. So that reflects in my work, and that's why I developed this kind of thing. So these are the saturation, and we have some actually in the exhibition. This is the first one I made, which I have uh, in the south of France. And this is an exhibition in New York, where you have the very first one. You can see that here you have red, blue, yellow, you have different colors. More recently, I've been working a lot more with uh, a single color, which is, which is gold where uh, at Art Plural you can see a few examples. This is to show that I can do some murals also, and I've been making a few of them. This is, for example, in La Cour des Comptes in Paris. Um, they, they have, you know, it's a very traditional building, and they have like artists from three, four centuries ago, three centuries ago, who painted ceilings in a very traditional way. And then they look for an artist to paint one particular ceiling. It's a library. And uh, they, they put us in competition. All, uh, at the beginning, I said, I don't want to do it, you know. And uh, but they insisted a lot. And so one day, in uh, really, and I'm, I'm saying the truth, in about two minutes, I said to my assistant, okay, take a painting, show me. Okay, make it uh, vertical like this. Okay, take that, then make the triangles like this inside, you know, and this is it. I sent it to someone who reworked it very well, and uh, then they painted it completely, and this is what we got. And it's, it's very successful. It's gold, of course. Huh? Gold and uh, purple, I mean, the dark blue, violet. There is also some red and probably some green in it, but always very dark like in the paintings that you can see at Art Plural. Okay, and then, uh, because I was doing, you know, square paintings, not horizontal or vertical paintings, but always square, because it's more abstract, then one day I thought, hey, how about taking some freedom, like some, you know, being more fantasist, and I went into making shapes, you see, like stars like this, or cutting the, the, the square, uh, this is a square originally, it's actually in the exhibition also, uh, in, uh, in four parts, and uh, doing this just to, just to improvise, you know, to see where, uh, you, know, what, you know, if it's interesting or not. And again, I will say that I have no explanation for that. I, I have no, uh, you know, rational uh, thing to tell you about this, uh, this idea that I'm doing that. I just think that it's adventurous and perhaps it's good. Perhaps in the future we'll say, look, he was totally uh, uh, outside of his shoes. Uh, these are some triangles that I put directly on the floor. They are not hanging on the wall. They are on the floor, leaning against the wall. 